Now, as I said at the beginning of this massive reviews, almost eight hours ago, Kamen Rider Double was a massive success, quickly eclipsing the prior Heisei Rider shows financially to the point you would need to take two of any of the prior shows to equal or overwhelm what was earned from it, and its popularity with fans. Even to this day, it remains a high watermark, with the complete selection and super best releases of the series drivers, for example, being some of the best-selling ones of those lines. And this is where they fucked it up! To capitalize on Double's massive success, during Oz's run, Toei commissioned a sequel event focusing on the secondary writer of the series and one of its villains, to be released directly to home video. And if you haven't gotten the puns with all of Double's film events bar cores, Batman Begins, Batman Forever, Batman Returns. There you go. And fortunately, they were smart in calling back in Keiji Asagawa and Riku Sanjo to write them, so they stay contiguous with this instead of someone that didn't know Jack about the show. I'd say this would be the beginning of the unneeded story sequeling of Kamen Rider entries, as after Double Returns, Toei would then pull this for Guy and Drive and Ghost to Date. But frankly, with Denno's insanely long movie run that lasted five years after its series' conclusion, and most people hate those sequels even if they liked that show, this is not only tame, but controlled in comparison. The issue with these, after the movie war, epilogue addendums, however, is... One, they're usually done very cheaply as Toei's trying to strangle out every last yen they can out of the property, or alternatively try and generate any form of additional revenue during a slump in sales and viewership that often they themselves fucked up to begin with. And two, in the grand scheme, they either are unnecessary or end up existing simply to include or fix things that should have been in their series to begin with. Both Gimes and Ghosts fall into this latter camp, with Gimes exploring the character motivations of four of its characters that weren't allowed the time in the main series. Though in Gimes' defense, it was cut several episodes short and did otherwise balance its ridiculously large cast pretty well in the main show, and its Gaiden films aren't unforgivably bad. And Ghost's Spectre movie actually finally explained what was with the Ganma realm long after everyone watching the show had long stopped caring and actually ended up contradicting its own damn canon. The consensus is Drive Saga Chaser has been the best of them, as it explores a central pillar of the show and his struggle with desiring to be human, which further informed an already existing character arc. Thus, it justifies its reason to exist. But Double Returns Common Order Axel and Double Returns Common Order Eternal most certainly fall into the unnecessary camp, as what they end up doing only really detracts from things when you start thinking about it. Axel opens on a dark and stormy night in Futo City. Someone must have gotten their hands on a weather memory. Again. With a group of pickpockets caught in the axe by Ryu Terui. The lot fleeing, only to run into... Zect... Troopers? Crap. Nothing in Double can really stand up to the power of Clock Up. Actually, they just reused the suits for this. Ryu rescuing them as Axel. These minions turn to dust, revealing they were just proxies. Maybe they were dust darts then. And all of them likely after the only survivor of the attack, who doesn't care if she was in danger, she just wants away from Ryu. Yeah, not touching that. After the opening credits set to Axel's insert theme, Leave All Behind, which is just awesome, we shift to the Terui household in Akiko. Still in the newlywed marital bliss mindset with her perfect man as she acts like a goofy goober. But now that they're married, she wants Ryu to drop his pet name for her that he's used since they met, Chief, and actually call her by her name. This is an actual driving plot point in this whole thing. As I'm gonna try and speed through this, and looking at how much I wrote in this script that actually didn't happen, let me summarize it. Akiko views this affectionate nickname as proof of an impersonal detachment distancing Ryu from their relationship, which was okay before, but now that they're married, she's concerned that he's intentionally doing so, and has simply been stringing her along. Not help that this is apparently his first day off he's had since their wedding, and he's choosing work over her. Despite the reassurance of her heterosexual life partner subordinates, 
Because damn it, everything is gay about this. As the trio go out to a coffee shop run by Frank and Lily Shiragane, simply to give now Nagasawa another paycheck and they'd struck the double set by this time, which only results in her panicking as Lily proceeds to tease her to the point she falls into an outright panicked craze, as the idea that Ryu doesn't really love her pounds away in her head, facilitating her pulling a lot of stupid stunts throughout the entire thing. Essentially, this whole subplot ignores the personal revelations that came about from Movie War Core, and to an extent Akio's greater character arc, where she became more comfortable with those around her, herself, and the faith she has in those she loves, by her becoming, after marriage, an extremely jealous, overreactive twat, undoing the development she has had over the series with her trusting her presumptions over what she should have actual faith in. Marriage changes things. You can't be this distrustful of your significant other like this without cause, especially with it spawning from something so little. I mean, Maybe had the series bothered to do more spotlighting of their developing relationship to show more of Akiko's insecurities, you could have justified this. But as presented, this idea comes out of nowhere, outside of Lily's light teasing about it. I don't know, maybe it could be justified by them just doing a winding down from a whirlwind romance thing since they went from meeting to crushing to dating to newlyweds in about two years, so their relationship's foundation isn't the most settled. It's just, with the extremes, character development for Akio to not be this impulsive, and the matter mostly being settled with Akio's storyline in Movie War Core, this subplot annoys the crap out of me. At Futo PD, Ryu is hounded by officers of Section 3, specializing in street crime, for letting people be murdered, this case having officially gone cross-jurisdictional as what Ryu witnessed mimic the M.O. for similar murders. Ryu notices the girl, identifies as Ao Kitsuragi, in several of the incidents and the linking factor between them, but apparently she's been on Section 3's radar before, the number two man of Section 3, Yukihiro Ono, calling her a waste of life, and pretty much speaking on behalf of his boss, Hiroshi Sagami. I see why there appears to be such a turnover in repeat offenders if you treat them with such respect. Still, she's likely the Dopont's target, so getting her to safety to discover what it's after is their priority. Well, he does outrank you. Aoi, however, is found in the billiards hall under the Narubi Agency, stealing Keiji Hasegawa's wallet. HA! That's for Ghost! Even though it really wasn't your fault it went that bad. No, really, that's Keiji Hasegawa in that scene. Though as they find her, Ono only makes the whole situation worse as he actively antagonizes not only a witness, but a target of their criminal. Meaning, regardless of her criminal status, since they're trying to bring her into protective custody to find out why the Dopan is committing these murders, he is entirely undermining their actual assignment. Hell, he dismisses an actual clue, an avenue of investigation, when she reveals her hatred of cops is because one murdered her father. In the exact same way, all these gang murders have been performed. Backed up by a flashback to two years back, which would have set this dead center in the height of the Dopont crime wave when Double was active. <laughs> and yet he says it's all lies, despite the consistency with their evidence. Aoi tries to escape because of this abuse, only for Ryu to once more detain her, ignoring her attempts to flirt him into distraction. Yeah, well, he really loves his wife. She apparently has this thing she does with cards. I can't exactly explain it, you kind of need to watch her perform it. The soldier minions of Commander appear again, but unfortunately, Aoi chose this time to swipe Axel from him leaving Ryu to defend her in solely civilian form. Sadly, as I critiqued in Double Forever, the Double Returns films also suffer from shaky cam action scenes, which is all the more disappointing 
as it prevents us from clearly seeing Ryu kick these mooks asses. Which from what you can see of the fight, is once more excellently choreographed than directed by Koichi Sakamoto's team. I really feel it was solely what they were doing with the camera, or not having a camera that could probably capture what they were doing, was the problem here. But not to fear, Jino is here! Backing up Ryu, with the power of slapstick martial arts. I could play Bulk and Skull music here and it would be perfectly appropriate. Actually, come to think of it, this is more in the vein of a Jackie Chan fight scene. And if nothing else, this movie gave Jino his shining moment in the series. <laughs> However, their commander comes for them, Aoi recognizing it as what killed her dad. And what he's after is something Aoi's crew swiped from him three days back, and has been trying to get it back ever since setting off all of these murders and public attacks. Unfortunately, she doesn't have it, hocking it to one of their middlemen, and Commander is not happy, strapping a bomb to her and giving them two hours to retrieve it before she explodes. And to make it worse, Commander takes Ryu's gun and shoots Jean, framing Ryu just as Ono finally catches up. However, going in and explaining what happened would take too much time, which Aoi doesn't have. Bullshit! They can show him the bomb, tell him what's going on, and get him on their side of this mess, but the movie's trying to make him a red herring for the Commander Dopont's identity. They're forced on the run, word of the manhunt getting Akiko up in arms, not because Ryu's been framed, but Ryu's with another woman as part of it, which coupled with her aforementioned insecurities, leaves her believing everyone else but her husband. Because she's reverted back in character to how she was before the series started. And it's her panic that leads to her running off to find him right before Shotar and Philip are trapped in the Shirogane's coffee shop by Section 3 agents to keep them out of this. Because with Philip's look of ability, they could dismantle this plot and acquit Ryu and find the real culprit in about... Oh, say... Five minutes, if that? Ryo and Aoi fake a pickup to get to the gang's head, who should have the device they're looking for. The man called Sensei, with them finding him in a restaurant surrounded by his agents and- Wait, wait, wait a second. I know him! That's one of the senior police officers that kept letting Toru Hojo pull his shit in Agito. This retroactively explains everything about why they never reprimanded him and let him do as he pleased. He was a corrupt cop enabling incompetence and interdepartmental conflict to keep the officers unawares of in-house criminal activities! Yes, I know they just rehired the same actor for a bit part, but screw it. That's my head headcanon now for an aspect of Agito that made me HATE that show! The boss tries to get Aoi to betray Ryu in the name of the criminal underbelly she grew up part of, which has made her black as night. But there's a few problems with that. Chiefly, she has a bomb strapped to her. Another, much better film fight scene in shoes, one that I swear I saw performed in the film Broken Path, aka Attack of the Yakuza. Which I highly recommend watching if you want to see the second MMPR Black and Quantum Rangers kicking the crap out of each other. This results in the boss giving up the trinket, and really, they didn't even know what they had. A Gaia Memory Enhancement Adapter. A late-release device which has the ability to triple the power of any Gaia memory. How it does is... not explained. Um, this is a papergraph reproduction I got from Myra, who's done a lot of commoner papergraph stuff on the internet. I presume it was a developmental alternative or a test-type production model to what would become Museum's version of the Extreme Memory, which Wakana then used, as it optimizes a single Gaia memory's power to its maximum level, possibly by reconfiguring its data to make the memory reach full compatibility with the user. Still, so few of the devices were made before Museum collapsed that this might as well be a one-of-a-kind item. And now that they know, they're not going to just give it... Damn it! 
We never see the unicorn Dopont. Why is that? The pair take off, and as they travel, Rhea reiterates words of encouragement to Owie that she should live whatever life she wants. Though Owie isn't sure that she can. As the daughter of a thief, she was always the first one suspected of, well, anything. She eventually just decided to embrace that, which has led her down the path she's been on. But Ryu knows firsthand that you can save yourself from a dark fate. He was, after all, with the support from others. And he's willing to help her if she'll go straight. Again, fate versus destiny. The two are different things. Though I should say this scene is excellently accented by a piano instrumental version of Leave All Behind that is just beautiful. Seriously, I want a copy of this and I've yet to find it. Ryo and Aoi get to the drop-off location, only to be ambushed by Ono, and have him beat the shit out of Ryu for humiliating him. But here's where we see it's not Ono who's the Commander Dopont, as he doesn't care about the adapter. The actual person is his boss. Hiroshi Sagami, who comes out of the blue and swives Aoi, not even caring about the bomb as he does, though neither does Ono, which is one tip off with how nonchalant he is. Though I must question, how the hell did Ono know to even come here? Sagami doesn't look like he tipped him off. Ono would have mentioned that at some point. He's just here to distract Ryu and let Sagami get away, but there's no way he should have just happened to come here with no reason. The second tip-off is him spouting his catchphrase, which shocks Aoi as she's in the clutches of her father's killer. But Ryu manages to get away to follow Sagami by... jumping from two stories up? Damn, man, even with you rolling like that, that had to hurt! Back at the coffee house, Shotaro and company finally come up with a plan to escape illegal police custody. Hello. I deserve that. Sagami admits to Aoi that, yes, he killed her father, and he's proud of it. Ryu chases Sagami by commandeering a bus, just as Akiko finds him and demands an explanation, only for him to then just drive off. Unfortunately, all this time has permitted Sagami to claim not only the adapter, but the axle memory, leaving Ryu powerless before him. Well, unless he just uses trial to transform straight into his super form, which he is never once seen doing. Zaxel needed to initialize all his gear. I mean, Extreme works that way. Trial's never been established to have that limitation. But because of Akiko pulling her insecure antics, threatening all along with a divorce, she almost causes them to crash and cause their collective death. Like a freaking moron. As even after seeing the Dopant, she can't think of anything but herself. Not that I... Yeah, see, this scene is supposed to be emotional and dramatic by bringing this sudden flaw in their relationship to a head, but it completely fails as Akiko is endangering other people's lives in her selfishness. And as she already learned literal years ago... But again, this movie entirely ignores any character development she even had to facilitate all this. She follows this with an ultimatum, her or Aoi. You know, I've never been in a relationship, I've only gone on one date and that was for prom, and yet, I know you don't pull this ultimatum crap. As, of course, Ryu's going to go save the victim. That's his fucking job. But Sagami's done his research on Ryu and his traumatic backstory, viewing them as the same. Sagami's wife was murdered like Ryu's family in the middle of the Dopant crime wave, the perpetrator being a man he arrested before, but walked from it scot-free. 
Oh, hey, mighty son. Yeah, um, no. Part of the problem with crime in Japan, at least from the research I've done, if I got the wrong details, I do apologize, is they have a high rate of turnover because they charge people with crimes without evidence. Thus, the people who walk free repeatedly just go in and out of the system like a turnstile, even the ones that are actually guilty. As they do not elaborate at all on the guy who shot his wife, it could just as easily have been someone whose life Sagami ruined with a false charge as an actual criminal. Thus, no, intent is not established, especially since they immediately then caught the guy that killed Sagami's wife and jailed him as is shown in the movie. So, Sagami's not taking revenge, he's killing out of spite for something that he just as likely could have had coming as a consequence of his own actions. Thus, while Ryu can understand the emotion of revenge that has consumed Sagami in his reasoning, especially with how he first appeared in the series, with the character growth he's gone through, it is impossible for him to condone his conduct, or agree with him when he tried to turn him on Aoi and get him to join his holy war against crime. But this is why Double Return's Axel is unnecessary. We did this story arc with him already! His character arc concluded with him forgiving Shroud. There's no need to try and tempt him back into the path of revenge, as we know he's not that person anymore! All Double Return's Axel does is reinforce that point when it didn't need to be, and otherwise has little of value within its greater story. Not out with how, since Keiji Asagawa wrote this one, that the cast went under a characterization reset instead of an advancement. Thus, they're not really doing or exploring anything new with the characters to justify its existence. Devil arrives at this point, wrecking the commander's soldiers, which allows Ryu to recover his memory. Unfortunately, the injuries he's taken before this have added up, especially as commander keeps hitting his leg. And without mobility, Axel's capabilities are pretty much crippled. Leaving Commander to get his... Commander, <laughs> and Axel is summarily bombed out of combat. However, Sagami gets an idea. In that, he'll become a new Isaka to make Ryu take his path, agree with him, and join him in the purge of all criminal scum. Kinda sabotages your own plan to want him to kill old evil since that'd mean killing you, but I'll chalk that up to dope on corruption at this point. But yeah, he's going to kill Akiko, kidnapping her in human form, and tying him up at, of all places, a rock quarry. Though by doing this, now you pissed Ryu off. No one kidnaps his wife. Take her, please. But apparently Sagami's motivation for why he framed Ryu goes beyond dopant corruption. It's jealousy. He snapped because Ryu got his happy ending. The one he can never have. Ryu, however, has a different response than Sagami expected, but one we've already seen. I'd say character arc complete, but again, they did this already. Aoi manages to steal the upgrade module, throwing it to Ryu after Commander fires missiles at Akiko, sending her flying in what is arguably the single longest fall ever. So long, Ryu has time to transform and still not have Akiko go Kersplat. 
Seriously, I don't know what was up with this one, but you could go to the fridge and grab a soda in the time it takes for Akiko to fall. Which would be fine if they did all this in artificial slow motion, but no, it's just Akiko falling. The rest is in real time, and in real time, with everything else that goes on, she would have gone splat long before this. Also, people blaming Koichi Sakamoto for cow explosions? Congratulations! This is the only scene I can find that he's actually credited as doing that commits the sins of that class of stunt work, with the gratuitous explosions and repetition of moments all taken in slow motion. But at least this has a point to it in invoking tension, drama, and resolve of Ryu trying to do everything he can, and just falling short. Having a point to why to fix it this way, still more valid use for the whole slow motion back explosions thing, even if it is badly executed. Really, how this should have been done is Aoi should have grabbed the adapter just as Sagami fired, thus he was distracted, and thrown it to an already transformed Axel. It removes the clutter of the scene and fixes the staging and time issues. Still, it's now time for Axel to get an upgrade. Axel, upgrade! And hey, no need to worry about a leg injury when flying, now do you? The film shows off Axel Booster evading Commander's shots with his new enhanced agility, the booster effect pretty much just taken wholesale from Geki Ranger because... direct home video budgeting, Sakamoto's worked with that effect before. Still, Ryu takes him out, in a way only Axel can. <laughs> Sagami is arrested, Ryu's cleared, Akiko gets what she wanted all along after Aoi admits she can't steal Ryu's heart, as it's already been taken, with her tearing up the divorce paper she got from Lily. Aoi decides to turn herself in, in order to restart her life right. Jinno is let out of the hospital, Ono apologizing for his part in this, and it all ends with everyone back at the Shirogane's coffee shop, with everyone making fun of Ryu for him preferring to use his pet name for Akiko over her real one. Everyone else choosing to do... That exact thing. Double returns Axel. Sorry, but they really did this better in Drive. Kamen Rider Drive's movie Surprise Future has a pretty similar structure to it, but better reasons for its protagonist to be on the run. It lacks unnecessary jackass-tastic corrupt cops, and the annoying love interest subplots, which actually serves as foundation building for that relationship, continues character and storyline advancement, and had a lot of pretty cool visuals not hampered by whoever was actually on camera duty. It's not perfect either, but at least it used its runtime better, and its mystery wasn't completely obvious with its execution. To be fair on this, it seems like Hasegawa was attempting to bring Ryu's character arc to a conclusion with the challenges presented to him here, to showcase the resolve and growth he's gone through thanks to his interaction with Shotaro and company and it does match with Hasegawa's belief that heroic characters in a story should undergo hardship or suffering in order to earn their happy ending. And I can see a more healthy relationship bud from this nasty thing about Akko's impulsive flights that could have mucked it up, but is now out in the open. But to do so effectively, I feel would have been better had this not reverted half the cast back in development, as it's not complementing the conclusion to an arc if everyone is not acting as if they even had one. A simple way to fix one of the issues of it, the Akiko subplot, would have been for Ryu to dress her down right after the whole mess with the bus chase. Not let her have her way entirely, but actually escalate this into a real argument getting all of this out of their system. Culminating with the question from Ryu of, do you not have faith in me? As that is the issue underlying all of this between them that doesn't repeat what was already addressed with the pair before as it more plays off of their newlywed status with this being a new chapter in their lives that they're not sure on how to act yet, and the answer then coming naturally from the following kidnapping and crisis that she does trust in him and was foolish to think otherwise, but was still just scared of losing him 
since she still doesn't know why he reciprocated her feelings in the first place, which would express why she went into her panicked and impulsive state of mind better than he doesn't call me by my name that the movie makes this into. As at the very least, it would show that their relationship isn't perfect, but will last through because they truly love each other. As opposed to the first bump ever seen in it, or another woman around him, making Akiko think such will drive them apart. As that's just juvenile and below even her and Hasegawa's standards as a writer. So let's make clear that whatever the issues that cropped up, they are happy together. As thanks to Drive Saga Chaser... Hmm? Yeah, Ryu and Akiko had a kid. Admittedly, that first popped up when the pair's actors cameoed in the Sengoku movie war with their XBs, but as someone that honestly did like the development of their relationship, it was better follow-up to it than this movie ultimately was presenting, in my opinion. And now, spool up the next vid as we come to the last of Double's content, and the absolute worst one of them all. Double Returns Eternal.